Good morning, everyone, and welcome to a beautiful morning in Illinois. My name is Stan Bourne, and I'm a farmer in central Illinois. And uh, this is a great time of year. Uh, during August, many times we find ourselves taking a family vacation. It's an opportunity for us to get away from our daily grind, for us to learn some new things, for us to see some new things, to experience some new things. And thanks to the Illinois Soybean Association and the United Soybean Export Council, we have the opportunity to do that today, and so do you. We'd like you to come along on a journey with us today and learn a little bit about what happens behind the bean down on the farm. The, uh, today, we are about 100 kilometers south of Chicago, Illinois, on Jeff O'Connor's farm. And we're going to take some time to learn a little bit uh, about sustainability and how we sustainably produce uh, soy here in Illinois. We're going to learn a little bit about the quality behind the bean and a little bit about the logistics and how we focus on being able to get that product from our home to yours. Today, we will kind of take a uh, drive-by. We'll talk about what goes on at the beginning of the season, how we prepare, how we plant the seed, how we nurture that. We'll, talk, uh, uh, we'll get a go to the field, actually, and see what uh, the growing conditions are so far this year. We'll learn a little bit about harvest and a little bit about logistics and transportation. We encourage you to engage with us today as we take this journey. You'll have the opportunity to submit your questions as we go along, and we'll do our very best to have Jeff give all the answers uh, to your, uh, the things that your inquiring minds want to know. So we encourage you to uh, submit those questions as we go along. Uh, with that, I'd like to hand it over to Jeff and tell us a little bit about yourself your family, and your farming operation. Thank you, Stan. Uh, first of all, I feel very touched uh, that you chose to take your vacation here today <laughs> and to share, the, share this story with whoever is, watch, is watching this. But um, good morning, everyone. Uh, Jeff O'Connor here. I am an Illinois Soybean Association director uh, representing an at-large area just with certain areas of soybean production that um, I feel that I'm uh, well-versed in. And I am also a farmer here in Northeast Illinois. And just as Stan said, we are about an hour south of Chicago. And so that puts us in a, a community which is a very rural community, but yet we are starting to feel some of, the, some of that um, influx um, and um, urban pre pressure. Yeah, urban yep. pressures that may be out there. So we really have a county which sees both sides. Uh, what I would like to share about the farm at this point, just as an introduction, just like as we choose a destination, that my family has been farming uh, since the late 1800s. They had immigrated from Ireland in the very late 1800s. We have been farming in this community and I would be a sixth generation farmer. Originally, as most farms were over 100 years ago, it was a combination of crops, forages, and animals. Today we are primarily just corn and soybean producers. Uh, I do include wheat in my rotation to add mm. some diversity. And after that, we also raise soybeans as well. So that does give us an opportunity to raise two crops mm. in one year. We do have conditions that would allow that. Um, as with every farm, uh, it is not just me. Even though I am the face today in front of the camera for you, there is much more than me that makes this <laughs> wheel turn. I'd like to introduce my wife, Gina. Uh, Gina plays a pivotal role in the farm that even though she is not a farm girl by birth, uh, she definitely married into it. And I'd like to let her introduce herself. Good morning, I'm Gina O'Connor. I've been a farm wife for almost 28 years now. We do have three grown children, uh, Morgan, Kelsey, and Evan. They're 25, 22, and 19. And uh, raising children on the farm is the best way to do it. I think I'm a little biased. Uh, but yeah, we've, we've enjoyed being on the farm, enjoy being a farmer's wife and helping where I can. Uh, we, our two oldest children are girls. We have a son who is 19. They all have gotten to share in that story. And we've shared this story of the farm and of production to many people. Even though this is a new experience doing one virtually, uh, we have had hosted many groups here and really enjoy sharing this story, which we will do today with you. All right, very good. Well, thank you for, uh, thank you for that introduction. So today, our uh, journey, as I said, we're going to begin at the beginning. We're going to talk about uh, what is required to get the crop in the field. We'll see the crop. We'll talk about harvesting the crop. 
But Jeff, one of the things I'd like to share with you about our audience is that uh, one of the things that we find is that sustainability is uh, important to our customer base. In fact, many of our customers have their own uh, uh, sustainability report or social responsibility report where they uh, not only look at the things they control but they look at things upstream uh, and we have a certification program called the the SSAP and uh, that uh, sustainability uh, program actually is becoming quite popular uh, in fact, uh, about 36% of all our export shipments have gone with the SSAP certification. And that doesn't just come lightly. There are things that we have to do as producers to be able to achieve that certification. Uh, so uh, we'd like to start with some of the things that you're doing here on the farm to support sustainability, uh, maybe beginning with uh, nutrients sure. and, the, and the things that you put into your crop to get it started. Sure. One of the interesting points uh, about the word sustainability is even though that term itself is a fairly new term that just permeates our culture and society, um, on a farm that's not a term stand that it has been as common through those generations. However, if we look at agriculture in the United States, conservation was the precursor to today's sustainability. And our country, um, both through the government and just local education systems, has had a strong ethic of conservation going all the way back to the 1930s. So, you know, we're looking at a 80 year time frame there. So most farmers uh, who are doing the work on the land would be much more familiar with conservation and that is shifting over to sustainability to where it's interchangeable between the two groups. So if we address the term sustainability as our customers value that term, um, in, in soybeans, soybean production, uh, we, it is easiest to think of the physical action that takes place in a field. But that physical action is predicated on really a 12 month cycle ahead of the soybeans on how we're planning mm. to raise that crop. So next year's soybean crop is already being planned now in August of this year. There is a strong rotation of corn and soybeans rotate on an acre every year. So the first thing that happens after a corn crop is harvested, it will be going to soybeans next year, Stan, would be that we need to place the, the nutrients that are needed for that soybean crop um, out ahead of time. So what we have behind us here uh, is a tractor that I use, and on the back of that stand, there is a fertilizer spreader that um, it has this, this piece of equipment, this fertilizer spreader has the most technology on it of probably any of the equipment that I have on the farm. And what it allows me to do is it allows me to control after the corn is harvested, uh, the broadcast application in variable amounts onto a piece of land that will stay in place then for next year's soybean crop. And I have to stress the invariable amounts because when we look at a field as a production factory, uh, every field has variable soil types on that field. Each one of them has a natural capacity mm -hmm. um, just because of the origin of that soil to provide the nutrients needed for soybeans. Because there is variability, we want to apply in methods that will even out that playing field. So what this, this applicator can do is as the tractor is going through the field, maps are prepared ahead of time that have those different rates and it will make those changes automatically. Mm -hmm. Now the difference is in seeing this on my farm. Um, and the farm that I operate uh, would just be considered either a small or medium farm. So this, this equipment here is becoming more common, but it's still not most common um, on a farm. It allows me to do that work, to plan ahead of time, and before soybeans are ever produced, the year before we're applying those nutrients. So it sounds like there's a lot of technology and it's truly an enabler to allow you to produce the product sustainably. And a lot of this equipment uh, uh, really looks pretty modern, looks pretty new. How have you seen technology change in this element of your operation over the past 10 years? Yeah, um, it, that 10 year period, Stan, uh, there has been a second and third generation of how technology uh, has adapted. Initially, when technology came to the farm, and if I speak of technology, I will focus on um, you know, the computer aspect of it. The first mm -hmm. thing that we saw on the farm 15, 20 years ago would have been guidance systems. And even though there was that mindset of, we don't need that, we individually can, can drive equipment, we <laughs> soon found that you know, allowing the tractor to do it 
allowed us to focus on what the, the important parts of, the, of what was happening in the field, which would be the nutrient application or the planting with this, uh, with the planter behind us or whether it's the spraying. So the initial was just the guidance systems, but once that was accepted by farmers, and it takes a while mm -hmm. to become comfortable with technology, um, it's just permeated everything we've done. There's not a piece of equipment here that does not have some kind of control, oversight, or guidance. Um, and it works very well. The systems have become very reliable and the support needed if there are issues really works quite well. So what we had here behind us was a planter. Mm -hmm. And so planting typically goes, goes on in the um, spring months of April and May. The, so we've now gone from the fall before where nutrient application was taking place, as you would know, Stan, to where we're now planting the soybean crop uh, in April and May. The next steps beyond that, once the crop is planted, would be some of the most critical steps, which would be using precise herbicide application to control the weeds. Um, controlling of weeds is probably the number one concern farmers have year in and year out. Mm -hmm. uh, weeds are very adaptive. Uh, to being able to find ways to get around uh, the herbicide applications that we're using. And it's not that they can get up and move, Stan, it's just that they be develop resistance. So the piece of equipment we have behind us here now would be a self-propelled sprayer on the farm. By my having that sprayer myself, instead of hiring the job, I can really wait for as good a conditions um, as are allowable. Perfect conditions would be great, but we don't always get that. And when it is time to do that work, I can go and do that. So the, the sprayer behind us will control the rate very accurately um, at relatively high speeds for ground mm -hmm. equipment. And it has automatic shutoff capability to it to where we can prevent overlap and, and just limit the amount of overspray that we would have ever, ever anywhere. So uh, this, that would be the third that would be the third um, piece of technology that we're showing here. So what uh, you've got a lot of technology here that you've referenced for application of the nutrients, for placement of the seed, and for application of crop protectants. What do you feel has uh, had the largest impact on, say, yield or productivity of the technologies that you've employed? Uh, I'll add a third word in there, Stan. If I look at profitability, w there's two aspects to that. Yes, you want to have the most uh, productive um, field that you can. Uh, you want to optimize yields. Um, but I first want to focus on the things I can control. Mm -hmm. And if I look at the expenses that go into raising a soybean crop, the technology has all worked together to where it's helped me to minim minimize excessive expenses and you know to stop over applying, whether it's chemicals or fertilizers or even seeding. All those costs add up. So we want, so th I focus on that expense side because that is in my control. On the productivity side, weather's still the largest player in um, what kind of yields that we will, we will produce every year. And so there's always uncertainty with that. That really does tie into uh, the sustainability aspect. Some of the cultural practices that I've taken place that my family uh, had really had introduced me to and how we treat the ground. Um, those sustainability measures lead towards more consistent yields year mm. in and year out. So even though technology plays a huge role in it, there's still that art of agriculture and of farming um, that I value highly that leads towards the care of that ground. And I know we'll talk more about that mm -hmm. in, a, in a couple stops, but it's that care of that ground and how we can produce consistently year after year with really good quality that even I am proud of and love to sell into the marketplace. You know, you mentioned a word about uh, variability and boy, we have certainly seen that uh, with changes in the past year or two. And what I'm thinking about is uh, the pandemic. Sure. Uh, what kind of impact has COVID had on your ability to operate? Yeah, as far as operating stand, farming has really, um, not it is farming has not been as affected as many of the other industries because what I do on the land is still predicated on what the weather is and what the conditions are. 
and when it is go time, it is go time. And we're really a very small unit. We met my wife earlier who helps in season. Uh, my father lives very close by. We have a very small core group that gets the work done. Mm -hmm. And just a few people can do an immense amount of work with the technology and equipment we have. So the pandemic has not had too much an effect on the operation of the farm. The biggest uh, impact that we have seen and we have it seen has just been the disruption of the supply chain to get us herbicides, to get us the inputs that we need to do that on time. Uh, first year was, was good because they were already in place. Uh, this year there's been more in effect and prices going up because of unavailability of products. So it, it has affected us, but not as bad. It is a lot. All right. Very good. Thank you. So I noticed from uh, our conversations a bit earlier that you produce both uh, GM and non-GM right. products. Can you tell me a little bit uh, about uh, the difference between those two? And particularly, I'm thinking about the, the cost structures. Uh, are, are, are GM products uh, least lower cost to yeah. produce or higher cost to produce? Yeah. Uh, so what's what's I have always enjoyed with soybeans is that there really are different classes of soy, soybeans, whether you're raising um, genetically modified grains or non-GMO, you can usually find the markets that will, that will pay premiums uh, to have that s specific product. And so when we look at a, I do raise non-GM uh, soybeans, which will end up going to specialty markets primarily uh, in, in, the, in the Pacific Ocean countries on the rim. And w one of the, before I mention a challenge there, one of the advantages of those non-GM soybeans is that seed is, it costs less. Um, so that's a, that's a great starting point when we focus on the expenses involved, so you do have some lower costs. That is offset by though controlling soybean, weeds in soybean fields is more of a challenge because you mm -hmm. have to use herbicides um, that will not kill the soybeans. So weed control, is more of a challenge. Mm -hmm. So there's always that balance between risk and reward, and you really need to pick which fields that you want to raise non-GM soybeans on that don't have a history of, of weed problems. Um, the other side, when it comes to the management, when you raise non-GM soybeans or IP soybeans, meaning a specific variety that may have certain characteristics which are desirable for food products, you have to have the infrastructure in place of storage facilities to isolate them. Mm -hmm. And we will talk about that later and that's something that my family's culture has always had of, we want to store our own grain to optimize which markets we work Great. with. It also does involve uh, any of the machinery on the harvest side or transportation side. We have to do a lot more work with cleaning them out to make sure that there's no contamination uh, between types of soybeans. So it's really a focus on the details. And that's not something that I find as a roadblock for myself. It's something, it's a way that we have always managed our soybeans as well. So there's opportunity there. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's neat that as you look at research that has come out on new ways we can use soybeans, whether it might be a soybean oil that's better for the, for the restaurant industry, or it might be varieties that do have um, higher oil content or different protein contents. I think it's really neat how adaptable soybeans can become. Mm -hmm. um, and for the farmer, it brings more opportunities if they want to take advantage of it. Right. Um, if not, there's always the route of raising just a commodity, you know, soybean that can be produced in bulk sure. uh, that most customers want. It, want. So, so let me just uh, make sure I'm, I'm with you here. It, uh, when we think about what we just saw yeah. in the nutrient application, in the placement of the seed, in uh, the metering, if you will, of crop protectants to be able to control various types of pests, be it weeds or, or be it uh, uh, bugs. One of the key takeaways for me was that um, input placement and control is really, um, really an important factor. And when we think about sustainability, the, the thing that has the single biggest impact is what we do here on the farm in the way that uh, we manage our, uh, that we manage the overall production side mm -hmm. of the business. And so efficient uh, 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 tractors, uh, use of biodiesel we, right. uh, we use, uh, and also uh, being able to have that proper placement and metering of the inputs is critical to having that good start to have a sustainable production process. Now, 
I'd like to just take a moment and turn to our audience and remind you, you have the opportunity to submit questions. So don't be shy. You're on, uh, you're on this little journey with us. So continue to send those questions in and we'll be sure to get them in our uh, Q&A and, uh, and share the answers with you. But at this point, we now have the opportunity to venture out into the field and see some of the fruits of the labors that Jeff and his family have done so far this year. So Jeff, tell us a little bit about uh, what we've got here. When did you, uh, when did you plant this crop and, and what kind of production decisions went into getting this uh, beautiful green field started here? Sure, uh, um, so obviously we're standing, we're standing here in front of a soybean field, but when I look at what we're in front of now, this is really the culmination of a lot of work and a lot of planning. This field, uh, when we talk about those sustainability measures, when we talk about the sustainability measures that we've taken in place uh, to produce this field, we see a soybean plant, which is about one meter tall. And, but if we look down to the ground, the way the soil interacts with this plant and the way the natural um, organisms that are in the soil, this field originally had um, a, a fee, um, it had a small grain, a cereal crop, growing in here to suppress weeds over the winter time. Mm -hmm. That is called the cover crop. Great measure that is being adapted across the Midwest, United States. For Another one of those management techniques that you're using, it, sustainable it is. management techniques. And what that technique is showing, it's protecting the soil in the winter. Soybean crop is only going to be in the field for about five months of the year. That leaves seven months where this ground is unprotected and bare. Mm. And that's not best for the soil. We want to keep the soil alive, the organisms that are interacting in the soil. So first of all, I had a small crop growing in here that was planted last fall. It grew all winter when it became time and the field was fit to plant the soybean stand. And this field was planted April 5th, which is very early. Um, so we had a crop here already that we just terminated with a herbicide application. Now, instead of working the ground, which would have been the common way of preparing a field for planting, 20, 30, 40 years ago, we actually just used a herbicide application to kill the existing crop that was here and then planted the soybeans into it. That's one, that's one of the conservation sustainability measures that works really well. So we don't see, we see no evidence of that prior crop that was here protecting the soil. Soybeans emerged by the end of April into this field. So this crop has been visible um, to the eye from May 1st on. So now mm -hmm. what we're looking at is about four months of growing. Um, these soybeans were planted at a population of 110,000 seeds per acre. Mm. And I can give a number that accurate because the planting equipment can monitor that exactly. The conditions were great for planting into. And we've had a very good growing season. As you can see, uh, we, have pods, we have pods up and down the plant all the way from within three to four inches above ground to where as we have moisture, we're still getting a little growth. These plants are already starting to get some yellowing on here. They're starting to mature and we will probably harvest them in three weeks. Mm -hmm. um, one of the key factors, Stan, that as we look at a soybean field is that this field, 95 acres in size, good size field, there are multiple uh, soil types out here. I had touched on that earlier. Uh, there may be five, six, seven different soil types, each having a different characteristic. One of the, the largest impacts uh, affecting soybean qual or production is in, in the Midwest, in Illinois, and particularly in this region, we have to use underground drainage. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's, this field is covered by an underground system about three feet deep that will take excess moisture away from the field uh, in the spring and throughout the growing season. Now. It, to explain to someone that we have to get rid of water uh, just to make a field trafficable, to do the best job possible, um, it's really needed. Otherwise, we would have a much shorter growing season with more diseases and problems. It's interesting uh, that you, you talk, Jeff, about all the things you manage. I hear the word manage, manage, manage. Yeah. And we talked about the use of technology to be able to do that, but you're also, uh, like with your cover crops, you're managing, and your tile, your cover crops and your tile, you're managing your moisture, making yeah. sure that uh, you have enough when you need it, and making sure that you don't have too much when you don't. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's interesting that all the attributes 
that you take into consideration to try to uh, affect some control over that for the benefit of the crop? I, I think that's one, it's a great point, Stan, because uh, I know from having talked to other, um, we've had other foreign, foreign trade groups visit the farm, and when we talk about sustainability, and I enjoy talking about sustainability, it's one of those basic tenets of what my family has believed about treating the ground, mm. but as sustainability is more common, what people don't realize, uh, I would love to only work five months a year raising the crop, but there is so much management that's added to, to, to bring out these other levels of sustainability. But the long-term effect is I can maintain uh, this land's productivity level, you know, for the next 20, 50, 100 years. And, that, and that's what we want to do is we want to maintain this productivity for as long as we can. Um, I think that the worldview of agriculture as we look at cultures and civilizations that have been in place for hundreds, if not a thousand years, using the same techniques that don't incorporate sustainability, you see a degradation of the soil mm -hmm. which tends to break down that productivity and to see a decrease in that. We don't want that to happen at all. And I feel fortunate that on land that's only been in production for 100 years, it's still in its infancy, and that through these conservation techniques, we can promote sustainability. And, per, and to me, it really goes back to uh, whether I have a son who wants to farm someday or anyone after me, they have the same productivity levels on mm -hmm. this land because of those sustainability and conservation measures. Very important. Yeah, that's interesting. You know, one of the hallmarks of sustainability is uh, one of the four basic tenets is continuous improvement. Mm -hmm. And yeah. you certainly demonstrate that through the practices that you mentioned that you've adopted with the uh, adoption of technology and your uh, nutrient control and disbursement and your seed placement and your crop protect an application, as well as things like managing water by using the cover crops and installation of tile. So lots of continuous improvement over the years. Your farm here, you mentioned six generations, is a lot different than what it was when your uh, 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 great grandparents uh, sure. emigrated from uh, from Ireland. So that's uh, that's fantastic demonstration of that. You know, one of the things that uh, I wanted to uh, talk about was that uh, uh, the environmental impacts that we have here uh, are um, uh, make a difference in what the crop is like. Uh, and we talk a lot, our customers are concerned uh, because about uh, crude protein, for example. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, we're raising soybeans and we're measuring yield, but our customers are buying oil and protein. And one of the things that's unique, I think, about what we do here in the U.S. is we have a very consistent profile in the product that we produce. Whether it's here in Illinois or whether it's uh, from down south in Louisiana or up in the Dakotas, uh, one of the things that's pretty consistent across the U.S. is our nutrient profile. And, and by nutrient profile, what we're thinking about is what our customers are interested in, and that is the amino acids that uh, get turned into protein, that get turned into meat, uh, or it's in the, uh, in the oil content uh, and the energy component mm -hmm. even in the uh, protein in the meal. And so to be able to achieve that, uh, a lot of the production practices that we do as part of SSAP, we've talked about the production processes, we've talked about continuous improvement, talked a little bit about health and safety and yeah. about how uh, we meter, if you will, uh, the uh, crop protectants that we use. But the fourth element we haven't touched on yet is biodiversity. And uh, so tell us a little bit about this pollinator plot and how biodiversity figures into your operation. Sure, so when we look at the rural landscape, um, when we look at the rural landscape, um, it's, not just, uh, it's not just that we're producing crops in a field, but if we look, we look here, staying off to our right, um, not all area is farmed. Uh, you know, we have, we have some areas, some edges uh, on the periphery where they're not as productive. And there's been a good emphasis through programs at a federal level and education that if you have an area of a farm which maybe is not as productive, rather than trying to continue to use the expenses uh, on those acres that maybe it's better to retire them and find an alternative purpose, which is not just production. So what this is an example of one of those popular programs is to plant pollinator habitat. Now pollinators are very important uh, to the environment. Uh, the diversity in these is, is pretty amazing. 
Um, but I have on my farms, and the farm is about 750 acres in total size. I have about seven and a half acres, 1% of the farm is now into pollinator habitats such as this. Mm -hmm. And as we look at this today, um, to the viewers, it may look pretty impressive to see this kind of wildflowers. Um, it's actually much better in June and July. Now, why this is important, I place this here just as kind of a test plot. It's within five feet stand of a soybean field and a lot of, there's been a lot of press, a lot said that you cannot raise soybeans um, in a modern production system this close in proximity to pollinators um, because these are very sensitive plants. I wanted to find out whether that's true. I'm not one to back down from a good challenge and actually these pollinators exist this close to soybeans mm. very well. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, so this is just an example of what that can look like. Uh, th the number of insects, the pollinators, the birds, what this does for the overall habitat. Uh, first of all, it's aesthetically pleasing. It's nice to see something different than a soybean field, but it actually improves that soybean field um, and the quality of life for people who see it. So when I look at this uh, ringing uh, on the perimeter of some of our other farms, it really adds to the over aesthetics and to just the health of the environment around us. And it's, it's a good indicator of what we can do uh, with some of those mar more marginal lands rather than continuing to put inputs on them um, without the great production levels. All right, very good. The, uh, uh, so again, folks, thank you for the questions that are coming in. We're gonna take one now. Uh, what would you say is the most challenging aspect of producing uh, soybeans here in Illinois from a perspective through the lens of sustainability? Okay, if I look at that lens of sustainability, um, there's two things that, co that come to mind as being challenges. One, I can control, uh, and that would be weeds. Um, pests in the field are, are a real challenge. And the way that affects sustainability is, I could take the approach of every time you see a weed in the field or something bad going on, you go treat it. That's not part of that core of, of, core of what sustainability is. We only want to do what is necessary for the production without harming the environment. Uh, the second thing which is, affects productivity on a farm the most in Illinois would just be the weather. Mm. And okay, we can't control the weather. In, we, we have a little bit of impact that we can make on the weather based on the drainage that we mentioned on the field, which is below ground, but we still don't control the weather. And I think one of the changes that, one of the changes we have seen is that our weather patterns are becoming more erratic. When we do have heat and dryness, it's more extreme than it used mm -hmm. to be. When we have rain events, some of the totals that we receive, Stan, in those rain events uh, is excessive. As those become more extreme, it actually plays into sustainability well because as I implement some of these practices, uh, like a cover crop in the off season, it actually in improves the resiliency of that land through the highs, uh, and the lows of those weather extremes mm -hmm. to produce a consistent crop. That's what is most important for me. I need to know that I can produce a consistent crop, which some, a customer will value Absolutely. in the end, Absolutely. year in and year out. And those conservation and sustainability practices help to mitigate the effects of extreme weather. And what I've seen in, in I've been working with this for about 10 years, but yet it's something that my family had done before me of respecting the land. It really improves that um, the sustainability component and the consistency from year to year. And it's a business, that's what we want is consistency. So when we were out in the uh, soybean field here, we uh, uh, didn't talk about GM versus non-GM. I know that you grow both. Right. Uh, what is uh, this field and what percent of your uh, production do you dedicate to non-GM production? Right. A, a great question, Stan. So if I look at my soybeans, this, this soybean field that we looked at here, is resistant to three different uh, non-selective herbicides. So it is a pretty traditional soybean that you would see in the area. Uh, I do raise non-GM soybeans on about 40% of the acres. And usually when you're, I had mentioned earlier, when you're choosing those fields, you really need to start with what fields have the best history of weed control and which ones may give you fewer problems. Um, when I have raised I uh, identity preserved IP soybeans, it's always on a smaller portion. But that's one of the advantages of the size that I have is that I, I can and have an easier time of micromanaging to produce something that a customer 
in the end really mm, values okay. more than a traditional field there. Uh, the infrastructure we have in the community uh, in, in Illinois and all of the Midwest is outstanding to be able to offer those opportunities and to fulfill the needs well. Uh, it's once again, just more management on how you want to manage your sales, planning your storage of the crop, mm -hmm. uh, managing the clean out. You mentioned managing and planning. Uh, you said when we were in the field here that you planted on the 5th of April. Yes. And, and I know as a farmer, that's, uh, uh, that's pushing it. That's, uh, <laughs> that's getting pretty early. And, and that's changed a lot over uh, our lifetimes. Uh, it used to be that uh, uh, we planted in May and we uh, now are moving that up in April. What's the reason for that? There must be some advantage. W yes, one of, one of the, um, I think, strengths that we have uh, for the most farmers, and I have truly realized it is, uh, the system that we have in place for education uh, and for farmers to gain knowledge, um, it, I believe is much better because the dissemination of that information and that research is much quicker and much more timely. Mm -hmm. um, the Soybean Association is a great source of disseminating that information on, uh, for instance, planting dates. There's been research done that shows even though it goes against what we traditionally have done, what we culturally have done, that planting soybeans earlier and earlier uh, has shown advantages. There are some nuances to it that <laughs> you have to manage. And once again, weather wins if weather changes. But this, this was easily a uh, earliest I planted soybeans by a week. Um, but they look great. And what it does by planting earlier, I can harvest earlier, it extends out my time frame to, to, um, to harvest, which leads directly back to quality. Right. When soybeans become mature, you want to harvest them because that is when quality is the best. You don't want to have to wait um, for the second or third opportunity stand to harvest mm -hmm. that field because quality can go down. So timeliness and efficiency really is one of the backbones for everything we do. So one last quick question I want to squeeze in before we talk about harvest is as you just quickly, as you think about all the sustainable practices that you've had the ability to employ, what's your number one? What, what has impacted you the most positively? Uh, the use of cover crops and keeping that field. Keeping that, it active. Keeping that field as a factory, producing something, capturing something, sunlight, uh, sequestering carbon into the soil, building the health of that soil. That is the number one thing uh, that I've done that I have seen. And until you can see it, and you only see it by kneeling in a field, digging in a field, poking around, it's the number one thing I've done for consistency and resiliency right. of the soil. Very good, great answer. And, and just again, a reminder, you're still on a journey with us. Keep those questions coming. Uh, great, uh, great examples. Thank you for those. And let's keep them going. Now the thing that we're going to do is we've, we've talked about uh, getting the, uh, the, the field ready, uh, putting in the seed, managing the crop protectants. We've seen what's growing. We've talked about biodiversity. But now comes the fun part harvest. Uh, and this is the best time for us as farmers because this is when we get uh, the check signal about of all the things that we did, how good a job did uh, we do working with Mother Nature, yes, of course. Yes. So tell us a little bit about the harvest operation. We have a combine harvester behind us here. Uh, what, uh, what does the harvesting process look like, Jeff? Well, first of all, when we, we have to make that decision stand, when do we harvest? And as we looked at the soybean field earlier, there's a lot of green in there. Um, all of those leaves that were on there will fall off. Uh, many of the side branches will fall off that don't have pods. And we will end up with essentially a stick that's dry with pods on it that are dry and at the right moisture. Once the field reaches that condition, once the plants reach that condition, we do want to have a dry field to go into and, and um, to do the harvesting uh, without causing damage to the field. So then it's time to get out the combine. When you think about a farm and the, the, and the machinery that's out there, this is one of those that everyone, even the uneducated person will know uh, is used. This is a combine. So what this machine does, and the base machine is the part that has the wheels. For harvesting soybeans, we put a different head on the front of it. Now this, this can be changed um, based on the crop that you're harvesting. So what, it, what happens on this machine is the entire soybean plant is cut off as close to ground level as is possible. Based on, based on the proximity of the pods to the ground, we may cut two to three inches above the ground, we may be four to five inches. Mm -hmm. But what we do here is we cut as close to the ground as is possible to take the entire plant, uh, entire plant into the machine. And if we come around to the front here, Stan, we can get a little better picture. 
everything is cut off and it's brought into the center of the, of the uh, attachment on front, mm -hmm. it goes up into the center of the machine. And everything, everything as it goes into the machine is, is spun around in there, applying pressure to the pods to break open those pods to release the beans from those pods. Now that sounds simple, but it's happening at a rate um, which is just really hard to imagine how much material is going in there. The machine is designed to do that effectively and safely for the quality of the soybeans. Once you have the beans out of the pods, um, there's, a, there's a cleaning system which uses air first to take all the light debris, the broken pods, mm -hmm. and throw it out back. It's just a very simple, time-proven concept. Use air to take the light material and throw it out the back. And then there are essen essentially sifting tables that sort out the material by weight, with the heaviest material being those soybeans. The beans, which are then clean with no debris or little debris, fall to the bottom and then they're taken to the top of the machine and stored in a tank until it's full. Once it's full, we don't want to stop the machine. Uh, time and again, as we talk about all the machinery that we've had, we want to keep the machinery running. Mm -hmm. You know, this is a huge investment in a farm. This is actually the smallest uh, harvesting combine that John Deere makes. Everything is larger from this point, but we want to keep that thing moving. Mm -hmm. Most machinery on the farm may only have a useful calendar life of four weeks. I'll use this four weeks during the year and then put it away. <laughs> and that's and we want to keep them moving. So when the when we have a full combine of soybeans, we will have either a tractor and a wagon come out to the field or a truck and remove those soybeans while it's still harvesting. We do not stop. So that leads into a nice transition then the combine keeps rolling, the grain is taken away from it, and then we take it to storage, uh, which on this farm we do have an example behind us of a couple small storage bins which can be used to isolate um, those non-GM soybeans or identity preserved soybeans. Uh, there's a whole variety of different sizes of bins, grain bins that we have on this farm. Now, the grain bins can be used to store any grain. Mm -hmm. There's no differences. It can be corn or it can be soybeans. It could be wheat. With the only difference being as you go from one crop to the other, um, we do a lot of cleaning on these grain bins to make sure that there's, first of all, uh, no, no dead insects, no debris that's been left behind, no uh, soybeans that maybe were a GM that we do, do not want to mingle with a non-GM. So, so that, that's a great point because the, the quality is not just influenced by growing the crop, but it is also influenced by how you handle the crop. Abs absolutely. Uh, as we walk uh, away from the combine harvester here, I had to note that it looked like there were a couple of TV screens up inside the, the cab. And you talked about GPS and uh, said you can focus on other things. Is that your game shows or is there something else that you're gathering from those monitors? Stan, when you, when you have an occupation as farming where you all your work goes towards harvest, the last thing I would want to do would be watching a TV show while <laughs> harvesting is going on. What, the, what those monitors allow me to do, first of all, the combine guides itself. Uh, that combine will harvest, could harvest 25 feet at a time. I allow guidance to maximize uh, the width that I'm taking accurately. And then it's also giving me an instant yield of what is, is directly in front of me. As we mentioned, you know, that a farm may have, a field may have five, six different soil types. Right. Each one has a different capability to produce. And I like to see what that variability is because as much as data is, is an amazing tool. Data alone is not what allows you to optimize production on a field. I had mentioned earlier, there is almost an art to it as well. And there's no replacement for visually seeing. Um, if you have an area that's lower producing, visibly being able to see you know, some of the symptoms of why it yielded less or why it yielded more. So mm -hmm. what the monitors do is give me hard data and guidance to where I can focus on looking at that land as closely, as intimately, as you want to, so you can start that process for next year's crop to make adjustments. Great. So once we, we, once we have the grain harvested, we've put it on some type of wheels, some transportation <laughs> to get it away from the combine out of the field. In this case, we use a semi to take it from the farm we're working on. And this is our storage facility here, multiple sizes of grain bins here. Uh, if you look at a total capacity, there's a uh, capacity here for 1,700 metric tons that I can store. 
none of the structures are large, but because of the, the variability in sizes and the numbers, I can isolate farms very easily and gently while maintaining quality from one farm to the other. I don't have to intermingle that much. What we have here, the semi brings it into the grain handling facility. The grain is dumped into this large pit in the ground. Uh, it can hold most of the semi to where I can return that truck to the field with, very quickly. Within five minutes, this can be on the road again. Uh, the grain is elevated up from here on what this is called a grain leg. Mm -hmm. And as it goes up, you can see that there are different downspouts or tubes that go to each grain bin. Uh, everything is controlled automatically. I can dump the grain, whoever is driving the truck or wagon can dump the grain. Um, press the button to start elevating it and then get back to the field. Keep things moving. I, I know there's that constant theme and how we talking about efficiency and it, just keep things moving because you never know when weather may change and weather always will impact quality as well. So this would be the, so this is the grain storage facility. It facilitates quick harvest, mm -hmm. quick and timely harvest. What comes next then is the grain does not stay here forever. Right. Uh, I produce a grain. Uh, I produce a grain to be able to sell it, to bring in the revenue uh, that I need to operate um, for our family to live. And so, and I know we have a couple illustrations of showing what infrastructure we have in the area for transportation of this grain once it is, once Let, it is called. Let's uh, maybe pause just a moment and tell me, there's a lot of infrastructure here uh, <laughs> at your farm and a lot of different, uh, a lot of different bins. Uh, what's the reason for all the, why not just one big bin? Why so many different storage containers? It, it really allows the flexibility to, to isolate one farm's production from the other. Okay. Um, many of the relationships that I work with on the land, and that's something we hadn't talked about, even though I own some of my own land, my family owns a significant portion. I have other long-term relationships with landowners mm -hmm. where I farm their land that we, um, we wanna keep those farms separate so we know exactly how each farm produced that year and depending on what the identity of the soybeans were, uh, it does allow us to, to isolate those and take them to different markets as price, as price, uh, as pricing will dictate in the year. Maybe there's better markets to work to, to deliver to, um, than what I originally thought. So it just allows me to isolate that production. Yeah, which is a which is a great lead into the next point. So you've you've went through the process now. You've harvested. You've brought it in the truck. You've uh, preserved its identity in some cases with uh, uh, specific storage uh, facilities and locations that you got. Uh, but uh, it doesn't end then. No, we have to. Uh, we got to deliver, right? Yeah, that that is correct. So, so uh, tell me a little bit about our uh, infrastructure off the farm that helps uh, facilitate getting the product to our customers. Sure, Stan. As we look at Illinois as a, you know, the largest soybean producing state in the country, um, we're blessed with just about every type of transportation that is efficient towards the movement of grain. So this is a, just a quick map showing what that structure looks like in Illinois. Um, once again, Chicago's up here in this upper right hand corner. The farm where we're at today is about an hour south. Now there are three main features on this map. Uh, the largest would be these blue lines represent, in this case, the Mississippi River, which goes all the way from one corner down to the southern tip of the state. Uh, we have the Illinois River that goes through the center of the state, which allows grain from that central portion, the most one of the more productive parts, to use the river system. Over here on the lower, on the southeast corner, we have the Ohio River. Together, they all come into the Mississippi, which is just a great transportation conduit to get grain to the Gulf. The other systems we have in place here, the red lines would represent all of the major uh, US interstates that we have, which reach more these regions that don't have the rain, uh, or excuse me, the water transportation. You can see we're heavily covered with those major interstates for use by semi-travel. And then the smaller lines, all the green lines, are all of the different rail lines throughout the whole state stand, which can also transport grain. Now those, those um, facilities that are the rail that are handling grain, uh, they can go to any of a number of markets. They may still go to the Gulf and then load onto ocean going freighters. They may go directly to, um, um, to feed um, for poultry production or uh, mm -hmm. pork production in the Southeast part of the United States. A lot of the rail is used in the Northern region of Illinois 
for intermodal. They're going to intermodal facilities for the container markets. That is really a strength of this northern Illinois region is that the presence of containers and intermodal facilities is outstanding which would take grain to the Pacific Northwest. Right, so, and you, and those containers then can also go, with the, one thing that's not shown here is uh, Lake Michigan, the Great Lakes, we have a connection to the Great Lakes that will actually take us to the East Coast and uh, out to the Atlantic. I do not believe you can find a state that is better situated with great, great infrastructure for transportation. So once the grain is ready to leave the farm here and I have identified a market, uh, that it's going to go to based on pricing or contracts for the non-GM, we will use any of those number of uh, transportation systems. Plenty of alternatives. Okay. For myself individually, Stan, once again, uh, this is these are the local markets that I, I use. Um, this is not an inclusive um, picture because there's a lot of facilities, but the major ones that I use, once again, Chicago up here in the right. Here we are today down here at OC Farms with grain bins in the background. My non-GM soybean stand would end up going to this facility, Schooler Grain, which is north of us off of a major interstate. And many times when I'm hauling in my non-GM soybeans there, they are getting loaded directly onto containers and they're moving out to those intermodal facilities and in no time whatsoever, you know, they're headed out towards the Pacific Northwest. Uh, Schooler Grain, uh, they can clean, clean them to the quality that a customer wants. Mm -hmm. That's a great example. Um, also, I have FS Grain, which is a sh shuttle facility less than 10 years old. It can handle, you know, 100 unit trains or more. And the speed at which it can bring in the grain and load those facilities, um, it, it's a great system. And because of that, because they have access through rail to so many markets, very good grain competitive bids there. And then another local one that we have is Prairie Creek Grain. Um, which is just another alternative using a rail line. So, mm -hmm. and there's numerous ones that weren't mentioned here. We had to leave some room on the map, but if, if I were to look at within a, a 30 mile radius of me, how many different facilities could I take grain to? You're probably looking at a dozen different facilities and it's all predicated on who has those most competitive bids um, with the best pricing for myself. It is great when we can talk about bushels per acre that the crop produced, but what in the end, what we are most, uh, what we're after the most is really that what is the profitability per acre, and that's bushel times the, the price of the commodity that we're selling it right. for. One of the interesting things that you uh, mentioned was the, um, we've talked about continuous improvement as yeah. part of our sustainable process and how you apply that at the farm and adopting new technology for improved efficiency, for environmental impact, and for your health and safety. Uh, but it sounds like that process and that philosophy extends through the value chain. You mentioned about the investment uh, at some of these facilities uh, and that they continue to keep upgrading because uh, yeah. one of the things that I think we recognize as, uh, as U.S. soy farmers is that we don't operate alone. And uh, uh, we appreciate your business and we want to compete for that business. And logistics mm -hmm. is one of those things that we do pretty well uh, and that our customers appreciate. Uh, but the world doesn't stand still. No. Uh, our competition uh, invests in uh, in their infrastructure as well. But it's it's nice to see that uh, as part of the sustainable philosophy that we have here on our farms, we're investing in our business, and our supply chain partners are investing in their business as well as well to ensure uh, an efficient and reliable delivery of our product uh, to our customers' door. Um, let's talk a little bit about uh, uh, those supply chain partners mm -hmm. and uh, selection of the different varieties that you use in, in seed. How do, you, how do you go about that? What's the decision making process look like? If, Stan, if we were to look at that list of the number of varieties that I could raise on a field like the one we looked at in any given year, um, it's staggering the number of choices that we have. <laughs> now. A farmer doesn't want to have to pick from a hundred different varieties, and there there are probably that many. So one of the factor that goes into goes back to that workload, um, which I believe really does tie into that safety of the farmer as well. I want to have as long of a period to harvest soybeans as possible, and soybeans are a plant that you can the different varieties that we had mentioned, uh, they will all mature at different times. So I could choose a variety. If two varieties were planted on the same day, I could choose one that would uh, mature in the middle of September, 
I could really choose one that would mature a month later in the middle of October. Right. Right. So I have to, with a little bit of guesswork and good planning, when do I want to harvest that field the following year? So if I think about next year already, 2022, I have in my mind a game plan for which field I would like to harvest first. The soybeans that we looked at here were, are a fairly early maturity. Um, so they can be harvested in the middle of September. Because of the early planting date, I will definitely be able to do that. So that's one of those factors that allows me to safely harvest in a narrow time frame, but stagger those productivity. If I know that I want to raise a non-GM soybean or a very specific variety, um, you would be looking at that sector of choices for, for each one of those mm -hmm. varieties. Um, but there's countless, countless options out there and it's just more management. Yeah. I, I don't want to make management sound like it's a burden. It's part of the process. Right. And we yeah. are given the gift of 12 months to do this <laughs> process, but it actually is very continual on how you're trying to manage everything. Speaking of process, another question that we got from uh, our customers is, when we were back at the Combine Harvester, uh, we could see the uh, grain table that sure. you had for harvesting, and that thing is like 10 meters wide, and you're running at about 10 kilometers per hour in harvest, so it's a, a speed is your friend, uh, but how many uh, bushels can you harvest uh, with that machine in a, in a day? What will be typical for you? Sure, uh, so Stan, so we did mention, you know, that machine is the smallest on the scale that John Deere would have. And using uh, the width that we had there and the field sizes that we have, I could probably harvest uh, 70 acres in a day, maybe 80 acres in a day. Keeping in mind, uh, in the fall, our day length is getting shorter. So if I have a September harvest soybean, I have a longer daylight period to harvest, mm -hmm. I could probably do 80 acres in a day. By the mm -hmm. time you move to middle of October, day length is shorter, and soybeans are very sensitive to weather overnight, mm -hmm. maybe I could only do 60 acres. If you look at the bushels that would be associated with that, uh, an average soybean crop in this region, Northeast Illinois, 60 bushels per acre, uh, which would be one metric ton, um, I, I would look at being able to do 70 to 80 metric tons in a day. Okay. Um, you know, depending on where you are in Illinois, better soils um, and much larger machines, you can find machines that would be able to do two times, maybe sure. even three times that. One of the challenges, but I think also blessings uh, in Illinois, we do not have fields that are generally two, three, four, five hundred acres. If we did, productivity goes up. Um, we have smaller field sizes. Why I think that could be an advantage, that means when we have smaller field sizes versus the very large, it does take logistically more time to move equipment around. Um, you know, we all met my wife earlier, Gina. You cannot underestimate the role of somebody there to help move <laughs> equipment around, That's very true. important. Right. But it does mean with smaller field sizes, we can micromanage each field right. um, as a separate entity for the best product and the best return off of it. So it's both a blessing and, and a slowdown. So let's, uh, uh, oh, we're getting close on time and we want to respect everyone's time. The questions here are still coming. Uh, got another one here. Uh, we haven't talked about the crop this year. You know, our, it's always on our customers' minds. Uh, uh, how available uh, is the crop going to be? So can you uh, characterize for us uh, uh, what the 2021 crop uh, looks like? Sure. Uh, I always enjoy that question, especially when the farm has hosted um, international trade groups because everybody wants to know how the crop looks. Uh, crop looks to be an average crop at this point. We are, we are in a region where Northeast Illinois has, uh, we have been dry and hot here late, Stan. So that is, that is impacting some of the yield here at the very end. Um, looking at an average crop, um, parts of the state, Illinois overall is looking like it's going to have an above average crop. Um, corn looks the same, but we're looking at an average crop at this point. And as I plan for any given year, that's what I'm hoping for, is that my efforts and the weather will produce an average crop. That looks like what we're gonna have at this point would be an average crop going forward. All right, fantastic. Well, this has been uh, has been a great day. We've got uh, um, uh, we've actually got quite a few questions still coming in, uh, but we're nigh on uh, nigh on the hour. Uh, and uh, we want to respect your time. We know you uh, have many things to get done. So uh, I'd like to take just a moment to mm -hmm. kind of summarize what we've heard here today. 
And uh, then if you're available, if you have time, please stay on the line and uh, keep submitting those questions. Uh, Jeff is uh, uh, graciously available and we'd love to uh, uh, address the questions that you have on your mind. So uh, if you can stick around, uh, please do. And uh, we'll be here to try to answer some of the questions that are uh, backed up in the queue and we'll try to get to, to your question. So just to kind of summarize today, first off, Jeff, thank you uh, very much. Uh, been very gracious of you to hold us at your farm. And, uh, and, and tell your story mm -hmm. uh, to our customers. I know they uh, uh, welcome that. Uh, I hope they've enjoyed, enjoyed their little mini vacation uh, as we've walked around the farm here. And I hope, uh, hope you've, uh, I said at the beginning that a lot of times vacation is an opportunity for us to see some new things and to maybe learn a thing or two. And I hope uh, that you've had some takeaways from our time together today. One of the things uh, uh, that we hit on earlier, uh, we've talked a lot about sustainability. And uh, one of the things that I hope that you were able to see is how important technology is enabling us to continuously improve and to be sustainable in our operations. To be sustainable from an environmental standpoint, uh, to address our issues from a health and safety standpoint and our community health and safety, as well as the economic viability of our operations. Jeff wouldn't have been around for six generations if we hadn't been doing something right in, the, in that area. So I hope you see how important technology is. We also talked about data. Uh, Jeff talked about the data that he uh, uses to drive these equipment, the importance of uh, global positioning, uh, the kind of data that he gets off of his combine and how those help make his uh, decisions for the next uh, season. So uh, that, that data is very important to us as farmers to allow us to effectively uh, administer uh, and work in a sustainable fashion. Uh, we talked uh, a little bit about using that data to set goals. And it's important uh, that, uh, for, as a farmer's perspective, that we work to always set new goals for the next year about deciding what kind of seeds we're gonna choose, what kind of uh, crop protectant uh, strategies that we're gonna utilize uh, to set goals and to continuously improve. Jeff's farm has been around for a long time, but it's not the same farm that it was uh, 50 years ago or even 10 years ago. Uh, so we focus on continuous improvement to make sure that uh, we offer a high quality product in a sustainable fashion. And our goal is to make sure that we deliver value to you, our customers. Uh, we want to make sure that we uh, do that from the quality of our seed, uh, from the, the uh, ability to uh, reliably and consistently deliver our product to your door and to offer some added value uh, even with the SSAP certification. That uh, Remember that that is a, a verified program. It's third party audited, independent third party audited. And uh, guess what? It's actually free. You can uh, have this on your shipments and you can utilize uh, the, uh, the evidence of that in your supply chain uh, work that you do for your sustainability reporting or your uh, CSR reporting. So uh, with that, uh, again, I'd like to give a sincere thanks on, the, uh, on behalf of the Illinois soybean farmers and on the soybean farmers in the 30 growing states across the US. We know that you have choices in your source of origin. And we appreciate your business. Uh, if you're using US soy, thank you very much. If you haven't tried US soy, I would challenge you to uh, compare. We dare to compare. Uh, and uh, reach out to your regional directors at USEC. Uh, they can be very helpful in uh, explaining the advantages of uh, US soy. Uh, so Thank you for that. So with that, uh, we'll call that uh, a wrap and we're gonna move to take some bonus questions uh, and let's uh, wander back to the soybean field. Thank you all. So uh, you've got all of this infrastructure here, Jeff, uh, and you said that you bring the grain in out of the field, dump it in the pit, and it uh, flows into the various storage bins. Uh, how long do you hold on to that? Yeah. So. I always like to make the statement, um, I don't produce a crop just to stick it in those bins uh, for as long as I can because I love it. I did, <laughs> I did enjoy the process of producing it, but we do raise it to sell and that's where our revenue comes from. Um, based on the yields on any, any given year stand, sometimes we have phenomenal yields and maybe we have a little bit more than a grain bin will hold and I would sell it right at harvest time. Um, many farms don't have the storage that uh, like I do, 
um, and they would sell it right at harvest time and take it to one of those facilities that I mentioned. Um, soybeans specifically will stay on farm until starting in December. I have some grain that would, would be leaving, but otherwise it's staggered throughout the winter months and probably a little bit into next spring. Um, so these, these grain bins are, are designed um, with air that we can put through them to maintain that quality, honestly, for nine months very safely. Um, so at most nine months. That's a great into uh, great lead into our next question. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, uh, we're concerned about, our customers are concerned about, is uh, the cleanliness of their product. Yeah. They they want to be processing soybeans, not uh, foreign material. So uh, tell us a little bit about how you. Uh, what are the things that you do that can uh, help you control foreign matter in your uh, uh, in your process, and also maybe a little bit about moisture management. You kind of sure. touched on that a little bit with uh, uh, your infrastructure and your bins. So when we look at uh, harvesting soybeans, it is a very, the, the process that the combine combines all into one small area moving quickly, it's a lot. Uh, it's, it's impossible to have a completely clean sample where it's 100% grain. There will be something in there. Um, it really comes down to what the operator values. Um, the newest machines, Stan, are capable of making adjustments on the go multiple times a minute to where the machine itself will do that job very well. A um, little bit older machine for myself, it really comes down to the operator and every time he's unloading grain into a truck or a wagon or dumping in a facility, visual observation. Mm -hmm. And I know one of the things my family has always valued even though it really doesn't pay to have a greater quality, um, we, we know that you're allowed certain percentages of foreign material. I always try, my family has always tried to have the best quality we can put into a bin. Part of that is the better quality we put into a grain bin, the longer it will keep uh, accurate, you know, safely. And as we move it down that chain, um, it will stay as a premium quality for a longer mm -hmm. period. Um, it doesn't pay anything extra, but one of the comments that we do here, whether it's myself or my dad delivering grain, is we love hearing when we're dumping grain, somebody <laughs> saying, wow, that is a nice quality grain. Doesn't pay anything extra to me, but honestly, that little pat on the back saying somebody recognizes, we did a great job, uh, it's worth it. And, I, and that is one of the advantages. You, there's a number of farmers that can do that. Every farmer could do it, but what I would love to see and one of the th uh, comments we've heard from visitors, international visitors, is when they look at samples of soybeans, to hear an international buyer go, wow, that is a great sample, how do we get that? In theory, Stan, we can create that quality here and put it directly on a container if that container serves that market and send it right to right. them. Right, because there's lots of things that influence that quality. But, you know, Jeff, uh, I think, is being a little bit humble uh, about uh, his combine harvester because it's not just uh, something that you crawl up in the saddle and drive. There's actually a plethora of settings on that machine to be able to manage the quality of that grain, to keep from cracking the seed, for example, and to be able to uh, ensure that uh, even the decisions you make about what moisture to harvest that at is, uh, is important. We got another question uh, that has come in about the quality of uh, U.S. soy versus other sources of origin. So uh, let me take that one, if I uh, sure. could, uh, Jeff, to, just to give your voice, voice a little bit of a break. You know, uh, one of the things that we're really proud of here about U.S. soy, uh, we've mentioned this quality aspect. We do have uh, the ability to provide a very high quality seed. We've also talked about the um, uh, one of the advantages that uh, in that quality is how we manage the harvest. And we talked about moisture content. One of the things that we do is we harvest at a relatively low moisture content, mm -hmm. probably 12% or below. Many of our competitors find that they have to harvest at a much higher, uh, just because of their environment, at a much higher uh, uh, moisture content, and then they have to dry that product. And that has an impact on the quality of the bean itself. Uh, another thing uh, that is important about about the differences is our environment here. Just in the U.S., our, our natural uh, environment, temperature profile, soil profiles, and, and so on. And it uh, goes right back to the things that our customers value uh, being protein and, uh, and energy. Uh, one of the things, Jeff, about our 
product here in the U.S. that is quite unique. We grow soybeans, not just here in Illinois, but all the way down south by the Gulf and all the way up north to the Canadian border. And uh, that's a big geographic area. But surprisingly, the nutrient value, and when I say nutrient value of the product that we deliver, is very, very consistent. By nutrients, I mean the amino acids and the amount of energy that is contained in the soybean. And that's thanks to our, our geography. Uh, we also have uh, the ability to control um, uh, the uh, foreign material in the form of insects and so on, because again, our geography here, we get cold weather, and it takes care of a lot of the pests that we, uh, that we experience and allows us, again, to have good, uh, clean samples. So key thing, uh, the consistency of our crop, particularly the value of the amino acids, because that's the thing that turns into protein that turns into meat for those of you that are raising chicken pigs uh, aquaculture and other things and uh, also the uh, uh, the uh, the moisture content uh, d helps influence the quality and the energy that's in that also gives more value to our product um, another another question uh, you had mentioned when we were in the field out here early we talked a little bit about water management mm -hmm. and you talked about the cover crops but you also mentioned something about tile and underground drainage. Can you add a little color to that? How do you how do you manage that, and and how does that uh, process of drainage work? Yeah, I would be glad to do that. So I had mentioned earlier, Stan, in the Midwest, in Illinois, and even specifically in this region, uh, we have bountiful rainfall in a year's time. Oftentimes, though, uh, it comes excessively, and we have too much. And as, as climates have changed, uh, it's even become larger shifts in the amount of rainfall. So what we, have to, what we have found beneficial in all aspects to produce a consistent crop, both quality and yield, is this ground is actually drained artificially below our feet. So in fact, very near where your feet and my feet are, about three feet below, there is an underground tube that runs the length of this farm in patterns. Um, that will that have small perforations that allow excess water to, to get into that tube and be carried away to a drainage ditch. Now, what that does is, so if we were to have a heavy rainfall here, which would normally keep us out of a field maybe for, you know, uh, three, four, five days, maybe a week, with that artificial drainage, we can cut down that time significantly, maybe in half stand to where we can come back to this field, do the work that needs to be done um, in a timely manner, without damaging the farm ground. When we have a crop, all that leads to is a crop that is growing in a healthy manner. When, we, when this crop is growing in a healthy manner, with consistency throughout, uh, it will utilize the nutrients that are in the soil most effectively and actually keep those nu nutrients from leaving the farm through surface runoff or even through that uh, drainage tile. So having ground that is can soak up water like a sponge and be removed the excess water leads to a healthy crop. Mm -hmm. On the flip side of that, this field is also a field where we do have times where we don't have enough moisture. Uh, we actually have an above ground irrigation system on this farm. Mm. So in times where we are excessively dry or hot, which we are in right now, uh, we can go ahead and irrigate it. Now, Northern Illinois is not a region that needs a lot of irrigation, but sometimes, Stan, um, and what I have done so far this year is, you know, add, a, add two more inches of rain artificially. We'll add a little more yet, can lead to uh, the optimum yields on, on this right. field, this field alone. So there's not a lot of it, but by that combination of below ground drainage to get rid of too much, which we have, and being able to occasionally add from above through irrigation can lead to a really consistent soybean supply with great quality. All about another important resource management. We talk about these uh, resources. Uh, another question from the audience came in about um, what is the, the largest cost input that you have on the farm and, uh, and what else is uh, changing? Is there anything going down? Uh, but uh, what's, the, what's the number one uh, thing on your mind as far as cost? Sure, when you look at um, the cost to raising a crop, there are, there are two categories. One would be fixed cost meaning they're there year in and year out. The other would be variable, mm -hmm. the products that I add from year to year to raise that crop. Fixed costs, a land cost are the, are the most expensive, which is when you do see land that is owned by family, uh, it's generally owned for a long time and managed very well because we know the value of this asset and the value of that asset will increase as time goes on because they don't produce land anymore. Um, so land costs are the highest one, otherwise it would be machinery. 
I don't enjoy sharing the comment, but I enjoy watching people's expression, whether it's locally or from international buyers, when you share what the cost of one of the pieces of machinery um, are, to watch their face with surprise that you know the value of those is significantly more than an average house. Mm -hmm. And yet it's a tool that I only want to use for maybe a month, a year. Mm -hmm. uh, those costs are very high, but because of the quality in that machinery, and because of the maintenance that we have, they can last a long time if we desire. Uh, as far as variable costs from year to year, uh, both seed and fertilizer costs would top those lists. Right. So uh, let's talk about um, uh, cover crops again. You mentioned how you had a crop here before you had this crop uh, that was uh, essentially growing through uh, the winter. Uh, why are you using that? Is it, is it because of uh, weeds or is it water, all of the above? What, what's your driver for using those cover crops? Yeah, the answer is all of the above, Stan. Cover crops is probably, to, an internet, to somebody viewing this video, a new term. And I believe I mentioned this before, but it is worth mentioning again, the soybean is gonna be here for five months. That leaves seven months with traditionally, if we look at the historical perspective of farming, seven months uh, of a bare field. Uh, a bare field with nothing going on there is actually a way to degrade that soil. We want to keep something growing there and living because it builds the soil, it builds the health of the soil, it takes that carbon out of atmosphere and actually becomes an asset that we have into the soil. So by planting a cover crop and once I harvest corn, so a cornfield will be soybeans the next year, once I harvest corn, I will plant that cover crop, it will start to grow in the fall, it will remain there all winter, acting as a shield to protect the surface of the ground from mm -hmm. wind erosion, from water erosion. And then early in the spring, it starts to grow again pretty aggressively. And so it's protecting that soil for the, that asset for a seven month time frame while actually it making it more productive. And soybeans in particular can work with cover crops with very little uh, extra cost other than the seed, but they, they exist beautifully together. So mm -hmm. it's, it's, as I look at sustainability advancing across the agricultural landscape um, for the next 10, 20, six generations, boy, starting it on soybeans is, is the easiest way to do it with actually a lot of advantages for mm -hmm. water holding capacity. So another question that's come in, uh, when, when we think about, uh, you know, farming is a business, right? Mm -hmm. and, and there's a lot of functional aspects to running a business. And as a farmer, uh, you know, we have to be an agronomist, yeah. uh, we have to be a mechanic, uh, we have to be a communication specialist, uh, but one of the things we haven't talked about is we also have to be uh, a marketing professional. And uh, uh, we have the ability, you've mentioned about your uh, grain bins here, it gives you some latitude and your ability to market at different times of the year. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about uh, what percent of the crop this year uh, you've actually uh, uh, contracted ahead uh, or before harvest? Sure, this year, uh, if we look at soybeans crop, which is what we're talking about, I, at this point in time, probably only have about a quarter of it sold ahead of time. Uh, corn as a crop would be at about 50%. Corn yields are made in July and early August. Our corn crop looks very good and it's made. Soybeans still have some potential on mm -hmm. all the fields, but a farmer has to juggle what his cash flow is. When does he want to start bringing some money in to pay for next year's expenses? What are your personal needs? Um, and then the hard part that really didn't exist 30 years ago is reading the international market, reading the supply and demand and trying to gauge, okay, what are my financial needs and how does that interact with what I see the international market saying for price increases or price decreases. Mm -hmm. So as the crop is um, reaches closer to maturity, more of the soybeans would be sold as we get, as I near my completion for harvest and I see how the rest of the country is doing for yield, meaning we have the facts that will help um, decide when we're gonna make those other sales based on price reaction. Uh, one of the most difficult challenges that there is out there for a farmer because it's really a world market and we need to interpret that information mm -hmm. we're getting. So we've talked about now the uh, the marketing aspect and, and making those estimates, uh, uh, both based on your uh, cash flow requirements uh, as, as well as other factors. And we talked earlier about the fact that you grow both GM and non-GM products. 
Um, how do you, do you see any difference uh, in the yield, uh, demonstrated yield of the GM versus non-GM products? And do you have to manage them differently to achieve that performance? Could you just add a little color to that? Sure, very common question, Stan, and I would say yield potential on both the GM crops and the non-GM crops, yield potential is the same. Uh, where the challenge becomes is that when you look at a genetically modified crop like we have here, and I stated earlier, we could have hundreds of different varieties of genetically modified crop. I can really look at the other factors for that field. Um, how well does it grow early in the season if I want to plant in early April uh, versus weighing what, when do I want to harvest it versus what are some of the natural disease tolerances or the resistance to pest. Mm -hmm. On the GM crops, you know, the number of choices, you can really pick exactly the variety you want with all the other management considerations um, easily with GM crops. With non-GM, your, your choices are going to be, you know, a third, a quarter of that. So with the non-GM crops, I have to accept more that maybe I want to harvest in the middle of September, but because of the maturities, I have to go to the end of September. So I have to accept more, but that's where some of the price premium um, will pay for that loss of management that I have. All right, so we're getting, uh, we're getting close upon uh, uh, being 30 minutes uh, past, and we really appreciate you sticking with us. We, we've got time for one more question uh, at, that has come in, and uh, that is, uh, what is the, um, as you look forward, uh, what's on the horizon for the next technology that you think that you'll uh, have the opportunity to implement to benefit your uh, yield and the quality of the product that you supply? Uh, that, that's a tough question, Stan, to end up with, so it's a good one to end up on. Uh, really, the technology that I look forward to is not something uh, that we've seen today that's going to have wheels on it. Um, I look for the technology that will help me interpret and test the, the ability of this soil um, to show what its full nutrient profile is, and maybe I can find out that I'm still over applying nutrients by 10% because the soil can provide more of it. I really want to see that interaction with soil health versus the crop growing on top of it. Um, that science uh, is starting to emerge in a usable form, and then I'm really interested to see how that technology of measuring soil health can tie into not only climate change, but carbon sequestration. We know that carbon, if we put it into the ground, is a very stable, usable source, can mitigate more of the, the adverse and dramatic swings in weather, mm -hmm. um, but it's how do we measure that. So I am speaking of carbon markets, but I believe it's what's below our feet. Right. Um, there's always gonna be changes above ground, stuff that has wheels, but I'm interested to see on this asset that I have, the land, um, how we can read it and use it better. And so that just really ties into the sustainability message because, uh, you know, the. Uh, uh, continuous improvement is one of those things that uh, uh, is a hallmark of, of the practice mm -hmm. uh, and the protocol. And uh, you speak to that very clearly about understanding what's beneath our feet, understanding uh, the nutrient management uh, capacity and what you can do to enhance uh, getting that food uh, to the crop to grow a uh, better crop. So with that, uh, as, uh, as the sun is coming up and it's getting a little bit warm here in Illinois, uh, we're going to wrap up and let you have the rest of your day. We really appreciate, again, uh, your consideration of U.S. soy. We appreciate you sticking with us today. On behalf of the Illinois Soybean Association and the United Soybean Expert Council, uh, we thank you for your time, and uh, we just hope that you'll have a great day and consider U.S. soy. Thank you.